With its dinosaurs, zombies, and dangerous jungle expeditions in search of lost cities, Tomb of Annihilation checks every single box for what I would have wanted from a D&D adventure as a kid. As an adult, there was a lot I liked about it, and I saw a great deal of potential in the adventure. After playing through it, I would have to say that the adventure definitely has its moments, but also its flaws. There were parts of it that dragged for my group, and a few things that if I ever played again, I would have done differently. So in case you're thinking of leading your players on an expedition through the jungle, here are my top tips for Tomb of Annihilation. Don't start with a death curse active. There is a lot to see and explore in Cholt, and so little time to do it in. Even if your players have a good idea of where the tomb is, it might take them one and a half or two months just to get there on foot. If you go with the hook presented in the book, your group will have 79 days to reach the tomb before their employer dies. Now that doesn't leave a whole lot of time over for dinosaur races or detours. In my group's case, it took them about three months to track down the curse and end it. They did a side quest or two, but mostly just stayed focused on what they would need for the mission and search for answers on the curse itself. There wasn't really any time for them to visit some of the more interesting locales that were not directly tied into the main nar narrative. Now, the hunt for death curse is supposed to be stressful and pressed for time. The Players should want to take risks to keep pushing forward, and to be in a constant hurry. However, this ruins a lot of interesting things about the adventure. Port Nianzara especially is easily just rushed through so the players can get moving, which is a damn shame. And there isn't enough time to get the players properly invested in Cholt or any of the adventure's NPCs. My honest suggestion here is just toss out the whole start of the adventure. Give your players a few weeks to get settled into the setting and their characters, and then let the lo loose the death curse upon Feyru. I would suggest still having the player start somewhere outside of Cholt, perhaps Baldur's Gate, but it doesn't really matter where. Could just as well be Waterdeep, Neverwinter, or any other large city you prefer. Have them travel by ship to Cholt instead of being teleported. This gives your players time to get to know each other and bond a little before being thrust into the adventure together. I would recommend picking up the Tortle package from the DM's Guild and incorporating it into your Tomb of Annihilation campaign and to have Volofam Gedarm be on the same ship. This way they have someone who can feed them a bit of rumors and hints about Cholt, and gives them a contact who knows the merchant princes that they can use once they reach Port Nyanzaru. Now Volo is also a character whose inclusion in the adventure pretty much boils down to a cameo, so this way he becomes more useful. Of course, you should come up with some good reason for a player to travel to Cholt. Perhaps they're hired by Volo's escorts on this tour, or they work for the captain of the ship as guards, or have one of the Port Nianzaro faction contacts request that they come and aid them with a mission. One of the hooks for the Snout of Omgar in the Tortle package is that the players go there see to seek out Volo after his ship is lost. Now, as the players are on said ship, we can have them wash up on the shores of the Snout, and then they have to help the Tortles and recover Volo before hitching a ride on the next ship back to Port Nianzaro. Then let them have a week or two to explore the city or head off on a minor expedition, perhaps swing by Fort Balarion for a charter before you spring the death curse on them. As for getting the players involved with the curse itself, I suggest completely throwing out Sindra Sylvain. Honestly, she's a completely unnecessary NPC that the players have no connection to, unless you spend time setting that up before the adventure. Now, there's a much better patron they can, that can send them off in search of a death curse that is tied into the adventure aim to Cholt and has the same ability to reward the players if they succeed with the mission. The Merchant Prince, Jessamine, is dying from a death curse, and through, through the time that the players have spent in Port Nianzaro and through their good friend Volo, the players will have much more of a reason to interact with her and ultimately be hired by her to end the death curse. Make it an expedition. Cholt is a dangerous and remote place. Once you enter the jungle, you are pretty much on your own, so anyone heading out there best be well prepared. Now if you go by the written start of the campaign, that's not going to be the players. It is recommended that the players hire a guide, get pack animals or boats, perhaps hire extra guards and carriers for their expedition, but more than likely it will just be four to six heavily armed players rushing off by themselves shouting onwards! In part because players usually don't have to plan out long months-long expeditions for their adventures to be successful, and in part because they will lack the funding to do anything better. Now this might be fine, especially depending on what sort of a campaign you're after, but more on that later. But I feel it goes against the intended feel of the campaign. Now we want the players to experience a true jungle expedition here, and that includes the setup and the planning. 
First off, the guides are some of the best NPCs in the entire campaign. Each guide pretty much has their own storyline going on that they want to bring the players on board with. And it's almost a shame that you can't bring them all along for the ride. Whatever guide the players go with, they should be quite familiar with what is necessary to mount an expedition, so use them to convey to the players exactly what they will need. One of the first things the players will need is to raise a whole lot of money. Now, the adventure almost seems to take for granted that the players will do so through dinosaur racing, and if they go for that, then great. But I suggest having the guide bring them to powerful and influential members of the city, and then you let your players try to win over some sponsors for the expedition. Now some might be willing to throw their support behind the players just because of their cause, such as if we go with the setup I suggested, then Jessamine would give them a nice starting sum. Others might want the players to find specific ruins or recover specific items from the jungles, or ask for a percentage return on their investment. The Lord's Alliance are already willing to give the players a ship that will most likely never be used in the campaign for finding a few locations. Perhaps they are instead willing to fund the expedition if it promises to seek those places out. Or perhaps one of the merchant princes has learned that the royal family of Omu still lives and wishes to end the potential threat of a new monarch trying to usurp their power, so they offer to fund the expedition in return for ending that threat, whether it be by recovering the skull chalice of Chakagare or assassinating the heirs. Regardless of who decides to fund the players' expeditions, then they should receive more than the 50 gold per person that Syndra will grant them, if they ask nicely enough. But let the players work for it, make it clear by using advice from their guide that the jungle is not a place you enter without some thought. Skip the hex crawl. Tomb of Annihilation uses the concept of a hex crawl for a large portion of the adventure. What that means is that it's meant to be played with the map out, and you wander from hex to hex, checking to see if you encounter any random encounters, find any hidden locations, and check to see if you manage to press on. It's in theory a rather interesting and elegant idea, but in practice I really didn't like it. There's just so much empty space on the map and so much filler, and the exciting locations detailed in the book are so far apart and some are hidden in such remote places that players will most likely never encounter everything you want them to. I highly suggest just skipping the whole thing. Let some of the locations, most importantly the ones already marked on the player's map, be in the fixed locations, but place the rest where you want them to be. The best way to handle the journey through the jungle is to plan ahead. Roll up the mo most of the random encounters beforehand, or just pick the ones you think make the most sense, and then place the locations where you need them to be. If you want the players to encounter the Batiri village, for instance, place it a set amount of days into their journey, regardless if they go to that specific tile or if they end up slightly to the left of where it was meant to be, they will still encounter it. This way your players won't miss out on the best parts of the adventure. You're going to have to be a little flexible, however. If the players make an effort to avoid something, of course they should still be able to do that. And if your players decide to plunge headfirst into a swamp, you might have to throw out all those coastal encounters you had planned. I'm also a big fan of placing breadcrumbs and hints and letting the players choose their own path, even though what's on that path might be pre-written. A great example of this in the adventure that comes to mind is the Climb up to Mabala, where the players can spot the Heart of Ubtau, the Sigurat of Orolanga, and the Wreck of the Star Goddess, giving them several different locations to work towards instead of just hacking their way through the jungle at random. Other tall locations might allow your players to find landmarks, but they could also find old maps, letters, or tablets at locations that direct them to other places you wish for them to have the option to visit. Ideally, each major location should point the players onwards to two or three new ones. Now some DMs might be a little hesitant about pre-planning the player's journey, saying that it's railroading them, but honestly it doesn't matter where most of these locations are. They don't know where these places are meant to be, and I think that my way is more fun than just wandering the endless jungles in hope of picking the right hex. And remember, your players will be on a tight schedule here. Even if they want to explore all of Cholt, they won't have time, unless they want every single person who has the death curse to die. And the straight path to Omu skips over almost all of the best parts of the adventure. Decide on what kind of a campaign you want. Something that you will have to take into account as you are preparing to run Tomb is what sort of a campaign you are after. Are you looking to run an exciting pulp adventure swinging from one action scene to the next? Or is it a grueling tale of jungle survival as the players drag themselves ever closer to their doom? Because if it's the latter, you're gonna have to make some changes. As the rules are written, the 5th edition of D&D 
is terrible for any sort of wilderness survival. Unless your players went out of their way to roll a whole party without any magical utility spells, they can easily survive any conditions you throw at them. Temperature, lack of food and water, diseases and more, they're all pretty much easily solved by some rather low-level spells. If you want the jungle to be the main antagonist of your game, and surviving it to be a struggle, then you're going to have to make the conditions a lot harsher, or the spells that deal with them a lot weaker. Now one example that you can use comes from the YouTuber Z Bashu of the Animated Spellbook. A suggestion he had to make survival harder in D&D was to make it so the spell Goodberries consumed its regent. So if you want to magically feed your party, you're going to have to find some mistletoe. Not the easiest task in a jungle. If you want to make diseases more dangerous, then consider having lesser restoration, either just granting the afflicted a new saving throw to resist it, perhaps with advantage, or implement something similar to the 4th edition diseases, which had different stages. So lesser restoration would then lower the disease a stage, instead of curing it completely at once. But here's the most important part of this. Make sure you and your players are on the same page when it comes to what sort of a game you want to run. Your players may not want or like a gritty jungle survival story. Some groups might jump at the chance of running a meat grinder campaign, just rolling up new PCs each time they're stomped by a T-Rex or skewered in a pit trap. Others will absolutely hate that sort of a game. There are many ways you can run Tomb of Annihilation. Many of them require putting some extra work in. Just make sure you're not wasting your time and that your players actually want to play the campaign once you're finished tweaking it. Bring the jungle to life. Regardless of how you end up structuring your Tomb of Annihilation campaign, your players are going to be spending a lot of time wandering through the jungle. Now, jungles are vast, potentially dangerous places teeming with life. Your player characters come from a completely different kind of place, the Sword Coast, a place not too far removed from medieval Europe. To them, the jungle should feel like a different world entirely, and it's your job as a DM to convey that feeling. Keep in mind that everything from the birds and lizards to trees and flowers is new to your players. Throw in little descriptions here and there of the strange things the players see as they travel and make sure that every single day there's something new and surprising for them to see. To help populate your jungle, the book provides you with a series of random encounters. Now, these are good for the most part, although they are strangely specific and vague at the same time, and don't quite pop the same way as the random encounters in, say, Curse of Strahd. But they're a good start. The idea is that as soon as the players leave the safety of Port Nianzaro, they could run into just about anything. And the players should definitely feel like they could run into a T-Rex at any point. But I urge you to be a little bit careful about what you throw at your players. Especially since they might not be familiar with the creatures in question. Now, having a tree of assassin vines sneak into a player's camp at night and strangle them in their sleep might be fair game at level 1 according to the book. But unless you're running a meat grinder campaign, it's not going to be much fun. The goal is to make your players feel like the jungle is dangerous and a living thing that could kill them at any time, not just outright kill them the first chance you get. When it comes to the more memorable and dangerous random encounters, try to build them up. A T-Rex, for instance, might have a hunting ground that stretches over several days of travel distance, so the players might find the remains of its kill, find tracks or droppings, and hear its roars at night long before they encounter it. Once the ornery dino actually shows up, it doesn't have to be to eviscerate your players. It could be a chase scene, or you could give them a chance to hide as a beast slowly searches the area, trying to scent them out. Always think about why is the monster here and what do they want. The jungle is their home. Think of it as a giant dungeon and try to make sure that any given creature makes sense in the location before you spring it on them. And when it comes to those random encounters, there's not nearly enough of them in the book to cover several months of tracking through the jungle. A lot of them won't make sense to happen over and over again, and so you will have to modify them and add your own as you go along to fill out the travel time. If you're looking for more information on Chult, and especially its history, to bring it to life, then I recommend looking for the old 2nd edition adventure, The Jungles of Chult. It might help you fill out some of the gaps in your Chult. The Music Those who know me know that I put a decent amount of time into the soundtracks I use for my games. To me, an appropriate soundtrack is not only important to put my players into the right mood, but it also helps to put myself as a DM into the right mindset. Now for Tomb, I had a specific sound in mind. I wanted music to capture the jungle, the African-inspired culture of Chult, the sense of adventure and wonder, but also music that was at sometimes dark and ominous and that tied into my previous playlist for Firun. 
As such, I started out with the music from Guild Wars Nightfall. I'd recently used a lot of Guild Wars music for one of my Faerun games, and it was similar enough, but still different. I was actually surprised when I went back and I saw how many of my locations used music from Nightfall. I'd mostly remembered it from my combat music, but I'd used it from Port Nianzaro all the way to the tomb itself. The next couple of soundtracks I incorporated and used a lot was the soundtracks from Congo, The Ghost in the Darkness, and Blood Diamond. Three movies that all take place in Africa and have some tracks featuring African song that work really well for what I wanted. Then I also added the music from Apocalypto and Avatar, which both had some music that worked great for being far out in the jungle and experiencing both hardship and wonder. After I started the campaign I kept working on my music, growing my list with soundtracks from The Legend of Tarzan, and I also added a sprinkling of music from The World of Warcraft, Assassin's Creed 3, Uncharted 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and some of the Guild Wars 2 expansions. As always, I split up my music into playlists by locations or events, trying to make sure that the game had an overall feel to the music, but that each location had its own noticeable sound. Something that I did for this campaign that I hadn't really done much of in the past was that I invested in Sirenscape as well. I really wanted some jungle ambience, so it worked out rather well once I got it. Not only did it give me a jungle ambience, but there were also some tracks that worked great right in the tomb itself like the sound of swarms of insects, howling winds, and churning fire, and some nice lava ambience for the end fight. It does take a little fidgeting to incorporate ambience into your games along with music, but I think it's worth the effort, and I've been using it in all of my campaigns since. The Lost City of Omu Once your players reach Omu, they will be itching for the final dungeon crawl. The majority of the adventure is behind them, and they just want to throw themselves into the last stretch of the campaign. Before they can do that, however, they have to face down several of the factions that occupy the city, overcome several dangerous puzzle shrines, and possibly go through yet another dungeon. In part, Omu and his puzzle shrines serves as a way to prepare the players for what they're about to face and to train them for how they need to think to overcome the Tomb of the Nine Gods. It also sets up the story of the Tomb and the Nine Gods, something that for the most part players will surprisingly have had zero foreshadowing about until now. Omo is also a huge ruined city, filled with countless empty and uncharted buildings, so depending on how you handle the city, it can either be an exciting prelude to the final or a terrible drudge. <clears throat> First off, I'm not going to be talking about Ras Nisi and the Yuan Ti yet, we'll get to him later on the list. Now, the three main parts I want to talk about here is the vast boring emptiness of the city, the lack of foreshadowing you may face, and the shrines. If your players are dead set to explore the ruined buildings, each building will take them 30 minutes to clear, and there's a very short list of random things that your players may find in any given ruined building in Omu. The whole thing feels very much to be set up that way, to make it easy for you as a DM, and to discourage your players from stopping and searching the whole city for treasure. Both quite valid points, but I think we can do better. Several factions live in the city, and so for starters we can populate parts of the ruins with them. Think about how these factions affect the area. Players might find evidence of abandoned campsites or dig sites set up by red wizards, tools left in a hurry or abandoned protective wards from the, a previous night that may still be active. yuan hideouts, where the snake folks spy on the city and adventurers, might be hidden anywhere. Some of these might be lavish and comfortable, a getaway from the main complex for disgruntled yuan seeking some alone time, or just bored lookouts attempting to keep themselves comfortable and entertained while on duty. Grungs live on the rooftops of some of the houses in the flooded district. Now these grungs might be using the lower levels for storage, they may have erected huts or other housing on top of the houses they live in to shelter them from the sun and elements. There's also several tribes of veggie pygmies that vie for control of the city. No doubt these would have taken over some of the houses, preferring dark and moist places, and built homes in some of them, and maybe using others as farms for fungus that would do poorly out in the open. Most importantly, I would recommend using any exploration of the undescribed ruins to tell the story of Omu. Have the players find homes where the tables were set for dinner, then seemingly abandoned and now long since overgrown. Still locked cellars filled with bones where dozens of townspeople hid during a Sererax attack. None of the bodies show any sound damage, as if something just snuffed the life out of them. The remains of soldiers who put up a desperate last stand and were seemingly attacked by their own civilians, undoubtedly raised by Acerorax forces as zombies, although the players might not realize it. The remains of priests clutching holy symbols in a desperate plea for help that will never come as their gods already lay dead. Things such as that help to build up a story that is later revealed inside the Tomb of Dying Gods. 
And then we come to the shrines themselves. These little mini death puzzles are an interesting way to introduce the players to the kind of thinking that will carry them through the tomb. Some of them, however, are far too easy. Most of these supposed death traps can be avoided with flight or levitation, which is a little boring. I would think that the designers of the shrines would have put in some countermeasures against cheating. After all, they are meant to be challenges that only those who have taken the gods' lessons to heart can pass. Kubas on Shrines is the best example of this, a test of bravery where you have to keep moving forward. There is however nothing brave about slowly levitating around the room like a discarded balloon until you can snatch your prize. Ijin's Shrine is the worst of the bunch, and you really should change the puzzle floor to it. It's simple enough of an idea, if you step on the same type of tile twice, it sets up a trap. Except the rightmost set of tiles are all unique, so you can literally just walk in a straight line and you're home free. You're supposed to have to think when it comes to a puzzle like this, perhaps have to backtrap a step or make a leap at some point. Walking in a straight line is a terrible solution for a puzzle, so consider adding an anti-magical field to some of the shrines where you think spells would just destroy the lesson being taught, or switch and switch up the ties to a Jin shrine. The Tomb of the Nine Gods The climax of a campaign is the delve down into the depths of the Tomb of the Nine Gods. It's six levels of death traps meant to test and challenge your players, but if they take their time and have learned their lessons well, they will make it through. For the most part, the dungeon is tough, but fair, which, to be honest, maybe it shouldn't be. It's meant to be a death trap, after all. But for the sake of not driving your players away from your table, it's probably best to keep it that way. My players ran into a few problems. For one, I had, to, I had run the campaign very much the way it was written, with only a few little sidetracks of my own making which meant that the players had barely found any magical items before making their way into the tomb. Now this proved problematic, as there are monsters in there that cannot be affected by normal weapons. Now, you can do the same as I did, and be sparse in handing out magical trinkets on the journey down, but ultimately this didn't do much to hinder the players. The first couple of fights it was exciting, and it forced the players to think outside of the box to hinder the golems and help their friends, but Quickly it made the fights drag and be a bit boring for those who lacked magical attacks. The, the group's ranger also quickly started to run out of ammunition, so if you have a ranged character who relies on ammo, consider throwing in a cache of arrows or bolts in the tomb. There are plenty of dead adventurers who could have had some ammo on them, or it could be found in the tomb dwarves workshop, having been looted of adventurers long since slain. An issue I ran into as a DM a few times is that the tomb can be a bit too cramped and small at places, and it doesn't always seem to fit with the way things are described or intended to play out. Two specific examples come to mind. The first was a set of hidden rooms filled with ghouls that operate a door. The space they were trapped in was so small that the ghouls almost had to be stacked on top of each other to fit inside of it. When the players activate the trap and the ghouls rushed out, they were easily pinned and destroyed. The other place is the corridor and small room with the life trap mirror. Now, my players decided to smash it, and thereby unleashing all of its occupants. The problem is, there's just not enough space outside the mirror. There's at least two large creatures trapped in there and several humanoids. With the entire group nearby, that meant that the line of creatures stretched halfway down a long, narrow corridor. There are descriptions of which creatures fight which, in, in the case they're all re released at once, and it's a crazy and chaotic scene that can be a lot of fun, but there's no way to play it out properly in a 5 foot corridor. I suggest instead to make the room with the mirror larger, and perhaps widening the corridor. As long as you can see the mirror when you round the corner, the trap works as intended. If you make the room 35 feet by 35 feet, the, the room still fits and the mirror will be the same distance from the corner. The tomb is very much a contained ecosystem, so in a way it makes sense that there aren't a whole lot of random encounters. The Adventure tells you to throw a Tomb Guardian or two at the players when you feel the need for some combat. Depending on your group and the pace you've set, this can get a little routine and boring after a while. Now, tomb Guardians are scary monsters, but chances are your players will figure out a way to deal with them or just get bored of them. Consider throwing in the occasional other encounter to provide a little variation. Some Tomb Dwarves might accompany the Guardians or try to lure the adventurers into trap if they're having too easy of a time. The hags can come and go freely to and from the tomb, so they would be able to stalk the players throughout the tomb as well, and could harass the players' attempts at rest. Uh, although do be careful so they aren't slain before their time. There's also stable, staple dungeon monsters such as the gelatinous cubes, oozes, and all kinds of scavengers that could have found their way into the tomb. 
and the longer the players spend in the tomb, the bigger the chances that some other group of adventurers might find their way in. The Death Curse is a global event, after all, and although our players are the heroes of the story, that doesn't mean there won't be several other groups making attempts to end the curse. If the players have, haven't run into Artisimber and Dragonbait, for instance, they could find their way in, especially if your players are struggling. Or you might want to introduce a group of ruthless adventurers who do not want to share the treasure or the glory, and would rather murder the group and take their gear to better their own chances. There is a particular trap where you have a chance to dig real deep into your monster collection. Uh, I'm referring to the Cog of Blood, the, a spinning room with five wardrobes, each of which summons a single monster from a different plane that the players need to slay in order to open the door. There's only a single set of encounters prepared for this room, and they're all rather memorable, if not necessarily dangerous fights. However, the chances are your players may pass through this room two or three times as the trap resets after a certain amount of time. Should that happen, you should feel free to throw in that monster at the back of your miniature shelf that you could never quite fit into a campaign, although it should still fit into the plane that the world opens into. There are several NPCs and monsters in the dungeon that can be chances for roleplay as well. Some of the inhabitants of the mirror can offer a lot of insight into the history of the tomb and be helpful in the player's travels. My players had a great deal of fun putting together the fate of the Company of the Yellow Banner and trying to figure out the truth behind the doppelganger. Biff Longsteel was very much a comedic relief for my group, and they came to enjoy his craven company, although they might not have been quite as forgiving towards him if they'd realized that Pox had more than likely murdered the original Biff to take his place. There's also others that are trapped, like the Toy Children, the Dao, and the Slad, and the Arcanaloth. All of them have their own agendas, and most of them desperately want to escape. Many of the NPCs encountered in the tomb are willing to travel with the players for a time, and most won't make it far on their own. None of them are really willing to lay down their lives for the players, however, and should be very much in it for their own survival, although many of them may end up serving as examples for what terrible things can happen to people in the dungeon. Some of the more interesting characters in the dungeon are the previously mentioned hags, who in part are responsible for the death curse. They're free to travel to and from the tomb and have potentially been spying on the players for most of their journey. Chances are, if you run the campaign as it's written, that these terrifying creatures will only have a brief cameo before being slain, which I find is a shame. I highly recommend having the Sown sisters make some appearances before, the, before you get to the tomb itself. Build them up and definitely use the random encounter where they sneak into the camp and steal some hair as foreshadowing for the clone thing that can be found in the dungeon. Consider throwing in some mentions of them before their appearance, perhaps a, through a nursery rhyme sung in Port Nyanzaru or cryptic warnings in some lost ruin. By the very least, have them cause a nightmare or two. Ras Nisi is wasted. In my opinion, Ras Nisi is by far the most underused and disappointing part of the campaign. There's quite a bit of foreshadowing about him, most people in Cholt have at least heard of Ras Nisi, and several important NPCs warn the players and tell of his tale. Most of the undead with Skulpa land used to be under his command, and he used to be the most powerful and feared villain in all of Chult. He also ties into several plotlines. For one, it is revealed that the city of Mesro isn't destroyed, but hidden, and it won't return until Raz Nizi is destroyed. The legendary former harper Arthur Simber is on a quest to restore the city and reunite with his wife, and so he will undoubtedly find himself seeking out Raz Nizi. The two places most important to Raz Nizi in his story, however, his old lair in the city of Mesro, are mostly just glanced over. Now I've already done a video on the city of Mesro, and I can say there's so much there to explore and see, even if it's looted, so consider giving it a look. And as for Ras Nizi's old lair, his home used to be a splendorous mansion that rode around a massive magical swamp on the back of undead turtles. For a life of me, I cannot understand why they don't even mention it in tune, let alone give us a location to visit and explore. Ras Nizi's ability to command the dead seems to have failed when Mesro disappeared, and so his palace no longer moves, but I really like the visual of it. I'd plan to lead my players there and let them find some more information about Ras Nizi and his past. I was going to have the ruins be infested by a corpse flower. The palace itself would be half sunken in on the backs of long dead turtles, and I, I think it could have been awesome. Unfortunately, my players didn't have any more time to explore at that point and had to leg it straight to Omo or they wouldn't have been able to end the death curse before their employer died, so we never got to visit the palace in my run of the campaign. 
The big disappointment, however, comes when you finally face Rusty Z. This half-mummified withered Yuan Ti makes for a great visual, but by the time most groups end up facing him, he can be killed by a strong breeze. If your group takes their time, he might not even be alive, having long since crumbled to dust from the weight of a death curse. Considering how much build-up there is, potentially, before facing him, I find it a little disappointing. Rosny C is supposed to be the greatest threat Chult has ever faced, and the players should feel at least a little bit of accomplishment after they end his miserable existence. I suggest boosting his hit points significantly, so he is still, still at least somewhat of a threat when your players meet him. By the very least, don't let him die in a hospital bed off-screen while your players are still hacking their way through the jungle. Power up a Cererac and the Atropol. So your players have crossed all of Chult and battled their way through one of the supposedly deadliest dungeons in all of the world. They now stand face to face with a never-born death god, and moments after its defeat they will have to face down one of the most powerful liches in all of existence. And I'm here to tell you they won't even break a sweat. A group that has made it through this campaign alive, unless they limped into the goal, will be more than ready for the end fight. And the kind of creatures that they are meant to be facing should not feel as weak as they do in the campaign. Atropols in previous editions had challenge ratings around 30, so for a mid-range group to just wipe the floor with one feels a bit underwhelming. Granted, it's my belief that the one in the Tomb of the Nine Gods is nowhere near its full power, but still. In my group I had an Asimar Paladin, who went all out against the Atropol in the first round. And since they're vulnerable to radiant damage, he nearly one-shot the creature. By the very least, you need to beef up both the Atropols and Asimar's hit points so that they stick around for a few rounds. If your group is capable of doing high damage bursts, especially if it's radiant damage, I recommend maxing out both hit points based on their hit dice. The setup for a fight is quite interesting, but a lot of the environment and the potential solutions of destroying the struts and having the soulmonger fall into the lava is unlikely to play out in a shorter fight. If you want to have more time to throw some NPCs or players into lava and force your party to have to find more creative ways of destroying the soulmonger, Consider increasing the artifact's hit points and the acropols, but also lower the overall damage done by both so that the fight lasts longer, and remove the soulmonger's vulnerability to radiant damage. I also highly recommend switching out some spells for Acererak. In theory, he is a terrifying opponent, especially with his ability to cast up to third level spells at will. Unfortunately, all the low level spells he has prepared are garbage, unless you consider the ability to cast Arcane Lock or Knock an unlimited amount of times terrifying. Give him some more useful low-level attack spells, and also give him a few buff spells. He has time stuff, but nothing really to do with it, so when Acererak appears, have him see what the players have done, cast time stop, buff up, and then go on the offensive. For the most part, when my players faced Acererak as he was written, he couldn't even punch through the health they were regenerating every round from being possessed by the Nine Gods. I was hoping to get at least one player down low enough for a power word kill, but I couldn't even get close. And ultimately, at this point, the players have already won. Even if Acererak kills them all, the death curse is already over, and the world is saved, so I see no reason to hold back. I wouldn't consider it a bad ending if you ended up wiping the party, as long as they stood a chance. And if they actually do make it through, the, through, well, the victory is going to be that much sweeter. Now here's usually the part where I ask you to look at how the character was portrayed in earlier editions to get some some tips and tricks and maybe a few cool abilities that the new developers left out, but when it comes to Cererak, there's not really any point. Now, I mostly know him from the previously from the original Tomb of Horrors, so maybe there's some 3.5 module out there that I don't know about that offers up a wealth of knowledge. Oh, and spoiler alert for Tomb of Horrors here, just in case you don't want to know how that adventure ends. A Cererak, like I used to know him, was not really one of the most powerful liches in existence. He was kind of a failure. He found his buddy crumbling to dust and was about to die, so he constructed a final death trap dungeon to lure adventurers in so that he could trick them into bringing him back and after devouring them he would live on his wretched existence for a few more centuries. He was a demi-lich, not an arc-lich, which, by the way, if I'm allowed to be a smidge pedantic here, he still shouldn't be, because an arc-lich is not a more powerful lich, it is a good aligned lich. In many ways, the Acererak that is presented in 5th edition is his own character, with no real connection to his original appearance, and that is fine, just treat it as such. And with that, I'm done offering advice on Tomb of Annihilation for now. It's a fun but flawed campaign, and I hope that you have a fun time running it, and that some of my advice helps. I hope to someday revisit Cholt, although it probably won't have anything to do with the Death Curse or Acererak. 
And as always, if you enjoyed my advice, then please give this video a like and subscribe if you want to see more. If you want to help support my channel, then share this video with your friends or on social media. It really helps out a lot. You can also check out my DM Skilled page or follow me on Tumblr or Twitter. Until next time, Dungeon Delvers.